us here today. He's willing to give us his time to come and share. So let's welcome Pastor Rick as he comes to the stage. Are you awake? All right, maybe I should ask who's asleep. Is, is that where I should start? Bobby, if I can have your help for just a moment, man. If you, get, if you will pass these out. A little bit of housekeeping here. I have no PowerPoint. I gave my, my technical person the, the, the week off. Uh, well, I didn't put this project on his, uh, on his table, I'll put it that way. Uh, we got some other things going on at our local church. So I've got a handout for you. And the best thing about this is, is because you can follow me along so you know how close we are to the end. You know, what happens is when, uh, when, when, a, when, when a speaker stands up here, especially a, a preacher, they typically say, in closing. How many know what it means when a preacher says, in closing? Absolutely nothing. Somebody said it. That means absolutely nothing. Because uh, usually uh, most, most of us have five, six, seven closings. And uh, we're, we're flying around like an airplane trying to find a, uh, uh, a place to land. Uh, the, uh, Jamie must know that if I got away from here to step out there, then, then the rest of the conference would be gone because uh, there's no clock in this building, so I have no uh, idea how much time it is. So he kept me up here, because if I stay up here, I will stay on track. So uh, does everybody have a handout? All right, that way I'll get started. I just wanted to go through that. Um, Jamie already said, uh, you can stop by our table back there. We're doing, uh, this this is for our ministry, primarily in uh, East Africa, uh, is where most of our ministry takes place, uh, that we're doing uh, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda. Uh, I'm actually looking at planning a trip to, to Mexico later this year as well. Uh, so uh, your, prayers would be, uh, your prayers would be appreciated. Thank you very much. So, all right, let's talk about the man that God created you to be. How many men are in the house this morning? Now, now come on. Now, I, know, I know just a few weeks ago, when that game was on TV, it wasn't that quiet. How many men in the house this morning? Yeah. All right, all right. There are a lot of people that tell us what a man should be, right? And you might be married to one. I don't know. <laughs> There's a couple of you. There's the rest of you. You'll get it on the way home. <laughs> There's a lot of people that tell us what a man should be. Society tends to tell us what, how a man should be, what we should, the way we should act, the way we should dress, what we should think, what we should buy, right? From all of those things of what a man should be. But as Christians, and what I'm going to spend the next just few moments talking about is what the Word of God tells us a man should be, you know? And... Let's start, I tell you what, let's just get, get right into it this morning. Joshua chapter 1, verse 9 says this, This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now, that last part says, the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. All right, now Joshua, here's what has happened in Joshua's life. Joshua has taken over from, from, from Moses. Moses has passed on. Uh, Joshua has taken over. He's got about two and a half million complainers that he is now in charge of, right? Everybody knows the story of the children of Israel. We know that they were complaining. They complained about everything. So Joshua is now in charge of these people. And Joshua's task is to take them across the Jordan River and to complete the task of taking the land. But Joshua has seen Moses for the last 40 years. He has seen everything that's taken place. Remember, Joshua was one of the original ones of the 10 spies that went in, he and Caleb, right? They're the ones that are left alive because they were ready to take the land at that point in time. So Joshua, he's having those things going on. Man, am I the man for the task? Am I the man for the task? You don't have to raise your hand, but have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt you had a promotion at job or you're thinking this is going on, that's going on? Am I really up to this? Am I really up to this? At some point in all of our lives, we all feel that way. Everybody just go like this. Shake your head like this, right? It's a safe place. We all really feel that way. But what happens is this, is that you look at me or I look at you, and I think, man, I wish I could be like that. 
I wish I could have that, that confidence. I wish I could have that, you know, that, that, that courage. I wish I could, whatever, fill in the blank. God has created you for something special. I had a couple amens. How many believe that? How many believe that you were created for something special? All right? All right, that's where we need to start. Joshua was created for such a time as this. I know that's a Ruth. That's from the book of Ruth, but, or, or Esther, rather. But Joshua was created for such a time as this to lead the children of Israel forward. All right. I got a couple blanks here just to keep you guys awake, all right? The first one is this is my command. And this applies to you and me today as well what God has commanded us to do. And that's that next part. Be strong and courageous. He says, this is my command. Be strong and courageous. Now, does that sound like a man to you? Yeah? All right. Be, uh, right yes. <laughs> Be strong. Well, we got that strong part down. We know what that means in our mind, yet whether, that, whether that's, you know, w- w- through exercise and lifting weights and all of those kind of things. It also can be strong emotionally. You and I, what we tend to do, I, I shouldn't say strong emotionally, but we tend to keep our emotions in check so we appear to be strong. Did you hear what I said? We tend to keep our emotions in check so we appear to be strong. We don't, let, we don't pull the curtain back too often, Right? In situations, you know, when, when men are together, typically men don't cry on, either, on each other's shoulders. Right? You got, uh, These lights are, I can't tell if you're awake or not, man, so I'm not for sure. Maybe I do need to come down there. All right? You're awfully quiet. All right. The, but that's part of, part of what either we tell ourselves is what it means to be strong or what other people tell us it means to be strong. Well, I, I, I can't, I've, got to, I've got to have everything under control. First, you and I will never have everything under control. All right? You and I, the sooner we admit that, the easier life becomes. We, can't, we don't have everything under control, but we can still be strong in the midst of not being in control. Joshua really wasn't in control here. God was leading them around. Joshua, he, 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 he can't control two and a half million people. But God says, be strong and courageous. Look at this definition of courageous that I wrote down here. Ready to face and endure danger, pain, or difficulty. Ready to face and endure danger, pain, and difficulty. Is that what you think of when you think of a man? That we're ready to face danger? How many of you ready to face danger? No? <laughs> You're, this guy's honest right here. I'm not ready to face danger. Let me, let me just encapsulate it real quick, and we'll move on. Everybody remember where you were on September 11th, 2001? Right? You remember the pictures. You remember the pictures of the towers when thousands of people were running out of the towers And there were a few hundred brave men and women that were running into the towers. That's courage. That's what courage is, running into the face of danger, facing it, facing it, facing it head on. How many many veterans do I have in the house this morning? All right. Thank you for your service, Jim. Thank you. You guys know what that's like. How many first responders in the house this morning? Any? Rob, yeah, I know you're back there, Rob. Thank you, man. The same way, facing that. It's not a matter of choice. It's a matter of duty. It's a matter of responsibility. And that's what Joshua, that's what God's telling Joshua here. It's a matter of you've got to step up and take charge. And I'm here to tell you today, we... All right, because this is about me as well. We have to step up and take charge and be what God has created us to be. All right? That last part, God is with you. You and I aren't in this by ourselves. Sometimes it feels as if we're alone, but we are truly never alone. We're truly never alone. 
And you and I, here's the beauty of this. You and I, we have, we have the presence of God in our lives that Joshua didn't have. Now hear what I'm saying. On this side of the cross, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Right? He, he's on the inside of you. You and I become the temple, the tabernacle of God. In Joshua's days, that wasn't the case. In Abraham's days, it wasn't the case. Elijah, Elisha, all the people we look to as heroes and men of God, your relationship with God and my relationship with God is very different than their relationship was with, with God because God dwells on the inside of you. So when Jesus said, I will never, or when Jesus said, uh, I, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age, even to the end of the world, when God tells Joshua here, and it's later recorded in the book of Hebrews as well, where God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That means God's on the inside. Wherever you go, whatever you're facing, God is with you. Say, God is with me. Say it like you believe it. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6. The woman was convinced, this is Eve, the woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. All right, we all know the story, right? God creates Adam, create, puts him in the garden, the an all the animals come around. Adam names all the animals. He realizes, hey, man, there's two elephants and there's two horses and there's two giraffes, but there's only one of me, right? God said, hey, it's not good. Let's, let's, let's fix this problem, right? Goes to deep sleep, took the rib, created it, right? We all know that. Recall at the beginning, God, when God puts Adam into the garden, he said, Adam, hey, there's a couple of trees in the middle of the garden, tree of life. Tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't mess with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right? That's what he told him? That's the Llewellyn translation. All right? Don't mess with the tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All right? So God told Adam, God told Adam, don't mess with the tree. At some point, Adam tells Eve because God never tells Eve, don't mess with the tree. Read through the story. God never tells Eve that. Adam told Eve that. So she knows that. So she's having, in, the, in Genesis chapter 3, she's having this conversation back and forth with Nakash, with the serpent, and we know how it all goes down, and he convinces her, so she takes it. And it looks, look at this. Look at this verse again. She took some of the fruit and ate it, and then she gave some to her husband who was with her. If we read this story, sometimes we read it quickly and we think, okay, so Eve is out there all by herself. The serpent deceives her. She eats the tree. She eats the fruit. And then she runs back to the house and finds Adam because he's out tending to the garden. And that's not, what, that's not the way it went down. The Word of God is plain here. She gave to her husband who was with her. Who was with her. All right. This is an example of how many are married in the house today? All right. This is the example of we as husbands, all right, we as parents, we as grand... How many grandpas in the house? All right, man, there's nothing better than being a grandpa, right? All right. We as grandparents, this is how... This is, this is the example of what we need to be doing. All right, be strong and courageous. There are some times you and I have to face some issues that we don't want to face. There are some times that we don't, there are things we need to talk about that we don't want to talk about. Right? Like the proper way to fold a towel, right? And hang a towel on the, <laughs> you know, the proper way <laughs> to put the toilet paper on the, on the roll. There are some things that we need to talk about. God had spoken to Adam, gave him, hey, this is the direction that you need to move in. And Adam had told his family, he told Eve, this is the direction we need to move in. God says, don't do this. Don't eat the tree. And he was with her when the whole thing was going down. He fails in his responsibility 
to oversee his family. Now, this isn't just a husband and a wife responsibility here. I know there were a lot of hands that didn't go up, but don't check out on me, guys, all right, just because you're not married, because this goes to the heart and the root of what it means to be a man of God. You and I, in, in, as we read the Word, as, as Jamie was saying earlier about being in the Word of God, it's important. We'll talk about that in a moment. As we're in the Word of God, God is going to open up our understanding, right? Somebody's pouring into you, whether it's a Sunday school teacher or your pastor or your small group leader or a mentor that's in your life, whatever that looks like in your life, somebody's pouring into you. And it's just not for you so you can eat the fruit of the land and be fat and sassy. It's so that we can, in turn, share that with somebody else. Those of us who have families, we share it with our spouse. We share it with our kids. We share it with our grandkids, those of us who are grandparents. And we set that example for them. We as pastors, we share it with those who sit underneath us within the, in the house. If you're, a, if you're a small group leader, you're sharing it with those people. You may, you may not wear an official title, per se, but there's still somebody in your life that you are influencing. Whether it be family, whether it be friends, whether it's a coworker, whether it's a neighbor, somebody, somebody's watching you, somebody's listening to you, and you may not even know who it is. So it's important for us, as God pours into us, as he tells us, that we tell others. And then that we just kind of make sure that we're still alongside of them. Like Adam, he's in the right place. He's with Eve, but he doesn't intervene. He doesn't stop in the middle of the process. That's part of what, remember when, remember when we started, right? Be strong and courageous. Sometimes we don't want to say something. You know, our culture today has made it easy for us just to kind of keep our mouth shut. And, what I mean, and you know what I mean by that, because we're afraid. It, it's no longer just, it's no longer, you know, it's always sometimes been difficult to speak the truth. But in the last several years, it's, it's, it, it's become increasingly difficult. Would you agree? All right. Well, that doesn't negate the responsibility that you have and that I have to be the man of God that he's created you to be. We can't step back from that. We can't shirk that responsibility. All right, let me fill in some blanks here because if not, then you'll walk away and you'll wonder, what in the world was I talking about? All right, God told Adam. Adam told Eve. She gave her husband who was with her. He was there. I said that. How about this one? What is he doing? He's doing nothing. God, Adam is doing absolutely nothing here. He's doing absolutely nothing. Now let me stop here and go back. How many of you remember uh, My Three Sons, the television program? Now, I only have two sons, so it's not me. All right, how many remember My Three Sons, right? How many remember the Andrew Griffith Show? All right. How about, how about Family Affair? You guys remember Family Affair? All right. What are those three shows having? Two of them are in black and white. That doesn't count. What do those three shows have in common? Single fathers, right? Single fathers. Back in the 80s, we had different strokes that came along. If you guys remember that, some, we're getting closer to some of your guys' age, right? All right. There was a time, there was a time in, in the history of our media where being a, a father, and even a single father, like Andy Griffith or, or My Three Sons, I, his name has left me right now, uh, that, that it was set in a positive light where these men were portrayed with positive characteristics. It wasn't, you know, sometimes we don't even know what happened to their spouse and what happened, but they were, here they are raising families and they're doing it not necessarily in the Christian, because it wasn't slanted that way, but with, with morals, with integrity, with character, right? 
They were not only raised in their families that way, but those men were portrayed in those, with, those, with those positive characteristics as well. As we make our way through, and I don't watch, because I can't even, I can't even th- can't throw out any, any programs, because if I'm watching TV, it's usually on the Weather Channel or ESPN or the History Channel. That's about all I ever watch anymore, unless my wife is there, and then we'll watch the Food Channel or we'll watch Hallmark or something like that. Uh, you guys, some of you guys know what I'm saying. All uh, right. The, <laughs> oh, the rifle, yeah, that's a great one too, the riflemen, absolutely, absolutely. Thanks, man. There were plenty of them. There were plenty of them. Nowadays, most of the, 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 the comedies, I mean, Andy Griffith was, a, you know, most of these were comedies, somewhat, with, 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 a, with a good moral or a, a storyline that carried character and integrity. Most of the most of the things today, I'm not going to say they're not worth watching. But anyway, I, that, that's a that's a judgment. I shouldn't make that judgment. I'll let you do the. I'll let you be the judge of that. That Holy Spirit direct you. But often the male characters, the father figures that are there, are demeaned. They're made fun of. Right? You guys know some of those. We've seen some of those that happen. All right. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. It takes courage for you and for me in the face of a society, in the face of of media that tells us this is what you should look like, this is the way you should act, this is the way a family is supposed to look or is supposed to operate. It takes courage for us as men to say no. Can you say no? Say no. no. Now say it. No. It takes courage for us to do that. And that's why I started with this verse, be strong and courageous. Remember those firefighters that ran into the building burn, b- built, burning building on September 11th. While everyone else was running out, they were running in. That's courage. Courage is sometimes going against the flow. Courage is sometimes going against the flow. It's sometimes, it's sometimes doing the thing that's not popular. In your own house, let alone in the family, right? You look at that son and daughter and say, no, you're not going out dressed like that. Come on. You understand that's part. That's part. You and I, we've been given that responsibility. As husbands, we've been given that, and fathers, we've been, get, be, we've been given that. See, this is what happens when there's no clock and I got a time limit, so I got to go really fast. My brain's already ahead, so my, my words get jumbled. All right? I'm not speaking in tongues. It might be Swahili. Yeah, it might be Swahili come out, but that's all right. Uh, <laughs> We've been given that responsibility to shepherd, oversee our family. You've been given a responsibility, no matter how big or small you may think your influence is, you've been given that responsibility. You may be the only man of God that's in your circle of influence. Think about, think about people that you know. Think about pe- your, 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 your cohort at work or wherever you are, maybe your neighborhood, whatever it looks like, you may be the only voice of truth that speaks into their lives. Have you thought about that? And God has placed you there. God has placed you there. Jamie, you better pray, man, because I'm not on my notes right now, but I need to say this, okay? Let me help you understand this. In Psalm 139, you guys can just jot this down because it's not in the notes. In Psalm 139, in verse 16, the word says that God, and David is saying, he's saying, you, you, Lord, you've written down all the days of my life in your book even before I was born. If we believe in what Isaiah says, that God declares the end from the beginning, do you believe that? You believe that God declares the end from the beginning? You believe that God knows what's going to happen tomorrow? 
If you believe the Word of God, it says He's declared all of our days. They're all written down. He's got His perfect will for our life. It's up to you and me whether we stay on that path. But He already has what He wants you to do and me to do, our destiny as it were. If that's the case, then God has put you in those people's lives. He's put those people into your life, and it's your responsibility, and it's my responsibility to speak the truth. That's why you were there. Beyond your family, not just your wife and not just your kids or your grandkids, those included, but that unsaved neighbor, it's across the fence. That, na- that, that, that the, the, the person you work with, that coworker, that student that you're with, and you know, where, wherever, whatever, wherever, you are a voice of influence that God has placed in their lives. So that's when he says, be strong, be courageous. Be courageous. In the face of adversity, they may not want to hear what I have to say, but sometimes we feel compelled to say. Now we can speak the truth, but we need to speak the truth in love, right? In love. Show the, show the love of Jesus here. Just don't pound, pound the table and point, point your finger. Show the love of Jesus. Be Jesus. Be Jesus in that situation. Because you know if Jesus was there, he'd be saying something. Right? But you also know that he'd be show, he'd be, he'd be, he would be saying it in love. Not judgmental. Read through the Gospels, Right? The only, people Jesus, the only people that Jesus got a judgmental attitude about, really, was religious people. <laughs> really. And when he was talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees, man, he was read. But everyone else, man, all these other people that were coming, he's love and compassion. He's, he's wanting to lead them and, and draw them in. All right, I need to keep going. We must take the lead. We must take the lead. It's not, it's not someone else's responsibility. It's your responsibility. It's my responsibility. Okay, look at this. Ephesians 5 and 25. Some of you guys figured I'd probably get here eventually, but let me set, I'm gonna set the record straight by reading this. For husbands, this means love your wife just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for you. All right, let's talk about ride or die when it comes to our family. All right. Some of us understand what that means as far as the natural, right? If something happens, we are willing to lay down our life. We're willing to step in front and take that bullet for our wife, for our kids, for our grandkids. You know what I'm saying, right? There are some special people in my life that I do. it. They're not related to me. They're not blood, but I would do the same thing for them. We've all got those guys that we ride with, right? Yes, no? Okay, all right. See, when you say yes, now I can move on, all right? If you say no, then I got to stay there longer. I understand how this works? All right, keep me going, keep me going. All right, thanks. <laughs> it says that Paul is saying here to the church at Ephesus that we as husbands, we need to love our families, love our wives in particular, but as fathers, loving our children, just like Jesus loved the church. Just like Jesus loved the church. Think about that. Think about that. Now, I'm not going to, all I'm going to do is I want to remind you of what Bobby said earlier because that's really what this is about. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Jesus willingly laid down his life so that you could have life and I could have life. And that same kind of unconditional love, that same kind of, of selfless love, that's what Paul's talking about. It's not about us. It's about others. It's about others. All right? Loving our families means doing the hard thing. It's not always about the easy thing. Right? It's about doing the hard thing at times. It's about running into the build, burning building when everybody else is running out. It's about being counterculture sometimes. You know, when our boys were little, we didn't, just because everybody else was watching some TV program didn't mean that we were going to watch it. I'm just saying. Right? Just because somebody else went to watch a movie didn't mean that we were going to watch that movie. Loving our families means doing the hard thing. The hard thing is not always the easy thing. Actually, usually the hard thing is never the easy thing. Right? 
Again, that picture of those firefighters running into the building. It's the easy thing is just to run away from the fire, right? Run away from the danger. Well, that's the opposite of courage. Courage says to face that, right? Face that danger. Face that difficulty. So stepping up and doing the right thing, doing the hard thing at times. Good things are not always godly things. I want to say that again. Good things are not always godly things. Sometimes we confuse the two. Sometimes we think, oh, this is a good thing, so I need to do this good thing. You may need to do it, but you may not need to do it. Just because it's a good thing doesn't mean you have to do it or I have to do it. Because it may not be for you to do. All right, give me, let me give you an example. Just because God has directed me to do something doesn't mean you have to do the very same thing. It may be a good thing, but it may not be the godly thing for your life. All right, can I say that again? Then we'll move on. It may be a good thing to do, but it may not be the godly thing for your life. You have to figure out what the godly thing is in your life. I have to figure out what the godly thing is in my life. Sometimes they're the same, sometimes they're not. And what I mean by godly, I'm not talking about sinful things and non-sinful things. That's not what I'm talking about. What I mean by godly things is what God wants you to be doing in your life. It's easy for us to look at someone else in church or look at someone else and say, okay, this is what I want to do. That's what I want to do, you know? When I, when I talk with pastors about this in, in my role as executive press, when I'm talking with pastors and helping them along, it, it, the, the, it's easy to look at the church down the street and say, hey, they've got a fill in the blank. You know, they got a, a school. They got a daycare. They got a feeding program. They got, you know, they got a water slide in their backyard. They got, you know, whatever it is. And, well, if they're doing it, I have to do it. My, my question is always, did God tell you to do it? Did God call you to do that? What you and I have to do as godly men is we've got to find out what has God called me to do. Some things we all have in common, right? We're, we're all missionaries. We're all to tell the lost about Jesus. We have that in common. But then there are some other things that God has spoken into your life and my life. All right, real quickly now. I want to pick up kind of where, where, where Bobby was. I was hoping he wasn't going to get in this too deep. Judges 16 and 19, Delilah lulled Samson to sleep with his head in her lap, with his head in her lap. And then she called in a man to shave off the seven locks of his hair. In this way, she began to bring him down, and his strength left him. All right, we know the, we know the story, right, about, about that. Here's the thing. Samson's head was in the wrong game. His head, his head... <laughs> When I've taught on this before, I always, I, 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 sometimes I'll title it, uh, where's your head? Samson's head is laying in Delilah's lap in a place that it should not have been. All right? It should not have been in Delilah's lap. All right? So he gets up. You know the story, right? Three times. The first time, well, if you tie me up with this, you know, green, you know, so she goes through. And then at the end, oh, Samson, Samson, you've lied to me so many times. Right? And at that point, Samson has gone, as Bobby said, Samson has gone so far down the road that it's hard for him to get back now. And he's got a problem. I think somebody said it right back there, right? He's got a problem now. He's got a problem now. See, it's not a matter of you making that decision when we got our head in Delilah's lap. You and I never need, our head doesn't need to be in Delilah's lap to begin with. Some of you are thinking about that. Our head doesn't need to be there to begin with. You ever heard the phrase, right, that we need to get our head in the game? All right. For us, it's not really that we need to get our head in the game. It's that we need to get our head in the right game. Our head is in some game. Our head is in some game, but it's not always the right game. Samson's head was in the game, but it wasn't the right game. It wasn't where he was supposed to have been. So my question to us today is, where's my head? Where are my thoughts? Where is your head? Where, where, where are your thoughts right now? Where are your thoughts right now? What's going on? What's going on in our head? 
Because that's where the battle takes place. That's where the battle takes place. See, Samson had purposed in his house, hey, man, I'm going to, or in his head, I'm going to go down there because that woman is down there, and I know she'd be fine looking. And I'm going to go down. I, I'm going down there. He, he purposed in his heart. Read, the, read, the, read the, the 16th chapter. I'm going down there. And he knew he shouldn't be down there. But he went anyway. What are you doing? What am I doing that we know we shouldn't be doing? Don't get all self-righteous on me. We like to do that. Well, bless God, I wouldn't do that. Come on, men. Tell the truth. You're in church. Right? We're all that way. If we aren't careful... Our minds drift. The enemy, the enemy, th- those temptations come. Those things happen. Those things, and, and our mind is taken away from the things of God. All right, I'm not going to read these verses. You guys can. I'm going to read the second one, not the first one. But I tell you what, how much time I got, Jamie? Ten minutes? Oh, I got plenty of time. All right. Philippians 4 and 8. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Watch this. If you don't have this verse memorized, you need to memorize this verse. You need to get it on the inside. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. You know, what's, what's on the inside is going to come out, right? Jesus tells us that, right? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You ever met somebody and they're talking about stuff and, and you, you get this feeling that they just really didn't believe what they were talking about? Yes, no, yeah? All right. How many have ever met a used car salesman? Are there any used car salesmen in here? Maybe I should have started there first, all right? <laughs> Before it's, all right. <laughs> Yeah, make sure that happens next time. I'll ask that question first next time. Write that down for me. I won't forget that. If people are passionate about something, you, we can tell it usually in what they're doing, how they talk, their actions, right? Their, their animation, they're animated about that. They're excited about something, right? We see it in sports world all the time, right? Because what's on the inside is coming out. If you and I, if we're trying to talk about something that we really don't feel passionate about, if we're trying to talk about something that we're not comfortable with, if we're trying to talk about something that really is not on the inside of us and not who we are, it's difficult for us to put that face on and move forward. It's hard for us to talk about those things. But, you know, if I, if I, if if you and I are in a conversation and I ask you about your, your, your employment, your work and what you do for a living, you're just going to go off, man. It's just going to boom. It's going to flow because it's part of who you are and what you do, what you're passionate about. Paul's telling us here, fix your mind on things that are good. Fix your mind on things that are admirable. And when we do that, and in what the Word of God says about being a man and what our responsibilities are as far as being a man, when we do that, then things that come, all right, from the outside, from other people, from, un- from expectations, or what the world says, this is the way a husband should act. This is the way a father should act, or a grandfather, or, or a man. This is the way, this is what it should look like. When we have the truth of God's word on the inside, those things, they cannot penetrate. Does that make sense what I'm saying? They cannot penetrate. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and 7, verse 7. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. He didn't give us a spirit of fear. So when he says be strong and courageous, that's something that he wants to do for us. Often you and I, we may not be able to stand on our own, but who lives on the inside? Right? Holy Spirit is dwelling on the inside, and he can bring that spirit of courageousness. You and I, we can, we, we can, be, we can be courageous on our own to some extent, 
But God will make up the difference. He'll help us in those times where we feel that we're alone or scared. To be the man of God, I was created to be, I must do these three things. All right, the first one is read the Bible. Read the Bible. These are three things. These three things, if you're not doing these three things, you need to be doing them. If you are doing these three things, you're well on your way to being the man that God created you to be. Read the Bible. Jamie already mentioned it earlier. We've got to get the Word of God on the inside, right? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's on the inside is going to come out eventually. And as we read the Word of God and we bathe our spirit in it and we bathe our, bathe our mind in the, spirit, in, in the Word of God, then the things that are around us, it's not so matter. It, it doesn't then become an issue of, well, I can't, I can't look at this or I can't go the, down that street because this is going on, that's going on. we got to avert our eyes and all those kind of things. When you are filled with the Word of God and the Spirit of God, when I am filled with the Word of God and the Spirit of God, the things of the world cannot penetrate us. Hello? You believe that? They cannot penetrate us. So the, the false philosophies, the false ideas of what, uh, of what family should look like, of what husband should look like, of what men should look like, or even a man of God for that matter that's being kind of redefined in a worldly sense, those won't penetrate because you and I, we've, we've ingested the Word of God. And I use that word intentionally. We've ingested it. We've, we've eaten it, if I can use it. I know you, you, that may, that may, you may push back on that word, but understand, Jesus called himself, what, the bread of life. And I don't know about you, but hey, if there's some bread in front of me, right, I'm going to be getting it on the inside. Hello? I'm going to be getting it on the inside. So the Word of God is the same way. It's for us to be, it's for us to consume it, get it on the inside so it becomes part of who we are. Part of who we are. You remember the, you remember the old phrase, you are what you eat? Well, hey, that's the Word of God. If you're not getting the Word of God on the inside of you, I don't even have to say anything, do I? If we're not getting the Word of God on the inside of us, we're already falling short. So you need to do it intentionally, not just on Sunday morning when you go to church. Hello? Not just on Sunday morning when you go to church. And I'm not just talking about just clicking off that devotional just because, okay, well, I've checked this off my list, now I can move on to other things. It's about doing it with intent, saying, I want to hear from God today. It doesn't have to be a long passage. It doesn't have to be a long devotional. But you and I just can't go through the motions when it comes to this, all right? Number two, pray. Pray. We've got to be reading the Word of God, and we've got to be praying. Now, sometimes, man, sometimes we, mystif we, we mystify prayer. We make it this big, you know, almost unattainable thing. Especially when Paul says, pray without ceasing. It's like, man, I can never do that. I don't think there's any monks in the house today, is there? No? Okay. So, so pray, you know, we've all got other things that are going on in our lives, so we just can't pray 24 hours a day. But that's not what Paul's talking about. All right. I have a son who lives in Ohio, and we, we message back and forth, texting or Instagram or something. We're messaging back and forth. Every day, every day. And sometimes it, it can, we can go a couple of days, and then we'll, we pick up the conversation right where, where we left off. Never do I say, hello, Nicholas, this is your father. I know it's been a while, but, you know, you may not remember me. <laughs> no. I can go for several days. And the same thing happens with my wife. I can go for several days don't usually happen, even if I'm traveling. But where does the conversation, we pick the conversation up where we left off. It's an ongoing conversation. You guys understand what I'm saying? All right. That's the conversation that you have with God. 
It's not about this real big formal prayer. It's more than God is great, God is good, let us thank him for my food. It's more than now I lay me down to sleep. It's more than all of that. But it's an ongoing conversation. So it's not just when you start in the morning, then I'm going to live my whole life, and then maybe tonight before I lay down, I'll thank God for the day. It's all, all day long. All day long, I'm just having a conversation with God. And guess what? I'm talking the way I'm talking to you now. Rare is the occasion that I pray in King James English. Rare. Because God, he's with me. He's on the inside. He's living on the inside. He already knows how my day is going. So I just have a conversation with him. All right? It's about conversation. So when we read the Word of God, read the Bible and pray, that's filling our mind, filling our spirit. The last thing is worship. Last thing is worship. I closed my folder, Jamie. All right, so I'm coming in for a landing. In conclusion, <laughs> is worship. Worship is important for you and me to be the man of God that God's called us to be. We need to read our word. These three things are really mandatory. Really, they are. And they're all kind of intertwined here. We need to read the Word of God. Be intentional in your reading. Carve out that time. But don't make it so legalistic that if, the, if you oversleep in the morning, you think, oh, man, my whole day is all, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm dying and I'm, going to, I'm on my way to hell now because I didn't do my devotion this morning. That's not, what God, that's not the intent. The, that's not the intent. Remember, pray. it's a whole conversation with God. It's an entire conversation, so I, I take that time during the day. It's not just in the morning. All right. Read the Bible, pray, worship. Now, I'm not going to define what that looks like. I'm just going to throw some things out for you. We've worshiped here this morning. We're going to worship again in a moment. All right? It's about that. It's about corporate worship. It's about, it's about you singing in the shower. Right? It's about you. If you're, you know, you're, out there, you're, you're, you're out there on the lawnmower singing, you know, it's, it's, about, it's about putting in that, that uh, well, yeah, I was going to say CD. I'm trying to, because we don't, nobody does that anymore, right? All right. <laughs> it's about having a worship playlist, all right? <laughs> yeah, there you go, right? It's about that. It's about eight tracks or cassettes or whatever. It doesn't matter. It's about... It's about setting the atmosphere. It's about setting the atmosphere. And you may say, you know what? I can't sing. Now, Bobby said this earlier. I can't sing. He said it so I can talk about it. I'm going to end with this and we're going to pray. We'll pull these, I'm going to tie all these loose, what appears to be loose ends together. Sometimes we feel I can't sing. Nobody wants to hear me sing. Well, for one thing, you're not singing to everybody else. You're singing to your heavenly Father. All right, how, how, many, how many parents and grandparents in the house? Raise your hand just real quick. All right. I would, I would guess that if I went to your kitchen and looked on your refrigerator, you've got some artwork that's there from your kids or your grandkids. Anybody got stuff hanging up? Right? And... If your grandkids or kids are very young, I could probably go there and look at that and have no idea what it is. How many know what I'm talking about, right? It could just be all scribbled and outside the lines, and it could be the ugliest thing I ever saw. But you've got it hanging on your refrigerator. Why? Because it's your son. It's your daughter. You understand where I'm going with this? It's your grandson. It's your granddaughter. You don't care what it looks like. It's theirs. You know? And if I start criticizing it, man, no, man, you ain't gonna, you're not going to let me criticize it. Because that's, that's your sons. That's your daughters. Guess what? Your heavenly father feels the same way about you. He feels the same way about you. Don't let anybody say, don't, you, need to, you need to be quiet because you can't sing, Bobby. That's No, no. Bobby needs to lift his voice because he's not singing for me. He's singing for God. Be the man that God has created you to be. When it comes down to this, ride or die, you and I can only do this, so much of this in our strength. 
Ultimately, we have to rest in his strength. We can't do it in our own. That's why it's important that we read, that we pray, and that we worship. As those things begin to happen, everything else in our life begins to fall into place. That's the foundation. That's the key to life in general. Read and pray and worship and allow Holy Spirit, who lives on the inside of you, the presence of God, allow him to, to lead, our, lead our paths, all right? Bow your head where you are. Let me pray for you. Father, God, we all, all of us, every man in this place, we all struggle. We all struggle, God, with being the person, being the man you created us to be. Lord, myself included. It's easy for, for us to look at one another and think, yeah, they've got it all together. But, Lord, deep down inside, Lord, none of us really do. Not in our own. Not in our own strength. And, God, I pray, I pray, Lord, for these men that are here today, God, that you would empower them to be the men that you created them to be. God, you've placed them in their circles of influence, God, and you've put people in their lives that need to hear the good news, need to hear the gospel. They need to hear the truth. And, God, I pray, Lord, that these men, Lord, that these men, Lord, that they would speak that truth unashamedly. Lord, that we would stand up, Lord, when the world tells us to, to, to sit down and to be quiet, that we would stand up and stand on your word, not on, what, not, not on our own beliefs or our own philosophies or our own things, thoughts, God, but on your word and what your word says. May we stand with integrity and character. Lord, may we be the husbands you've created us to be. I pray for the, the husbands that are in the house today, for the fathers, for the grandfathers. Lord, may we lead our families. God, I pray for those, Lord, who are in the workplace, Lord, have unsaved co-workers. God, let their light shine. Let their light shine. And lastly, God, I pray that we all would be sensitive to your voice, your leading of your spirit, that as we read and pray and worship, we would not only sense your presence, but sense your direction for our lives as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.